Okay, so in this video we're going to start probing a little bit deeper into the Minkowski geometry. And again, just to keep things simple, I'm going to keep working with a two-dimensional space-time so that I can draw a picture and so that we can kind of compare with the space that we looked at last week in the last video, which we'd studied the Euclidean geometry of R2, and now we're going to look at the Minkowski geometry of R2. So it's going to be R2, but if we remember, R2 is also equivalent to now our 1 plus 1 dimensional space-time. So we're looking at R1, 1, 1, and now we are going to study the Minkowski geometry, which, if you'll recall, was defined by giving the Minkowski metric. And now the Minkowski metric is given the name eta, just by definition. And as hopefully you'll be able to remember, we defined these Minkowski metric components as having the first zero, zero component being equal to minus one, which kind of represents the time metric component, because by, def by convention we always choose our zero coordinate to essentially represent our time coordinate, and then the space components had positive signs. So, in our two-dimensional space-time, this Minkowski metric is going to have the form minus c squared dt squared plus dx squared. So, you remember the c, ct represents our x0 coordinate, and we just have to, for now, include that c to make our, essentially, the units of our x and t axes match up. And so the Minkowski metric has this form, and we sometimes just represent it as just a simple kind of pictorial or just a symbolic representation of which component has the minus sign and which has the plus. And if we had more space components, we would have them in there like that. So just remember that this is representing our diagonal matrix, and these are essentially the diagonal components. So, for now, this is just a definition of a metric. It's the Minkowski metric. And now we're going to want to look at, essentially, the geometry that this metric is defining. So, we're looking at a two-dimensional space-time. Let's just have our picture. So, we have our x and ct axes. This is our two-dimensional space-time. So I just rewrote the line element a bit bigger there so we can see it. Now let's start probing a bit deeper into this Minkowski line element. First of all, obviously the presence of a minus sign is going to complicate things hugely as we're now going to essentially realise that, well, this line element... So if you'll just remember back briefly to the Euclidean line element, just for comparison purposes, it was of the form plus and then dx squared dot dot dot, always with pluses here. Now we have this minus sign present, so essentially what this means is that we have, or one of the properties that this Euclidean line element has is the property of positive definitiveness. Essentially, because we always have pluses, and these are always squared quantities, they're always going to be positive, ds squared essentially can never be negative, or even zero unless all of these dx's are zero. So we have ds squared is always greater than or equal to zero, and this is sometimes called the positive definitive property. That's for the Euclidean metric. And now a metric that satisfies positive definitiveness and a few other properties is sometimes called a Riemannian metric. But now let's have a look at our Minkowski metric and see how this is immediately going to change. Not only can ds squared quite easily be zero because of having this minus sign, if dx squared is equal to c squared dt, for example, ds squared is always going to be zero. Not only can it quite easily be zero, it can actually now become negative. If dx squared is simply just zero, 
and dt squared is some positive quantity, it's always going to be a positive quantity because it's dt squared, this minus sign is going to mean that ds squared is less than zero. So that might not seem too, well that does seem fairly strange, we always like to think of distances between points as being some kind of positive or the distance between two points could be zero if we're talking about the same point essentially in the um, Euclidean sense where all of these intervals between the points are essentially zero. There's no separation between the two points we're considering. That's the only case where ds squared can be zero in Euclidean space. But now in this Minkowski space, we can have ds squared equals zero and also ds squared be less than zero. So this is very kind of non-intuitive behavior. We're going to have to spend quite some time kind of fully understanding what this means. So let's explore this a little bit more. Let's look, or well, first of all, take ds squared and consider the points at which ds squared is going to be zero. So essentially, ds squared is going to be equal to zero and just rearranging this equation, we're going to find c squared dt squared that c, well essentially this expression is zero when dx squared is equal to c squared dt squared. Okay, so now let's start exploring this geometry in a similar way to how we did in the Euclidean space, where rather than looking at these infinitesimal intervals, let's well, first of all, consider their finite variant. So I'll simply just integrate it to remove the d's and replace the infinitesimal line element with the finite line element. And now, simply just by considering the interval from the origin, I can just effectively remove this interval symbol because, well, the value of the interval just becomes the value of the coordinate. And so again, we have a similar equation to as we did in the Euclidean picture, where we can effectively now just study the level curves of this function, which are going to represent all of the points in Minkowski space now that are a constant separation from the origin. So if you remember in the Euclidean picture, all the points in Euclidean space, which are a constant separation from the origin, just lie on a circle with constant radius from the origin. But now let's have a look at what the Minkowski look geometry looks like in comparison to the Euclidean geometry. So I first want to so I first want to consider now the points which are essentially zero separation from the origin. So S is equal to zero. So if we take s is equal to zero, we can just see this is essentially going to be achieved when x squared is equal to c squared t squared. And now this equation simply we can just well take the square root that we're going to be left with. And now incorporating for the plus or minus that we've introduced by taking that square root, essentially two. Um, lines essentially just through space and what do these lines represent? Well they represent all the points in Minkowski space which are zero distance from this origin point here. So let me just draw those lines for you now. So this should be a right angle here. So these lines which I've drawn x equals plus or minus ct. They're simply just straight lines now with a, a gradient of c. And now by kind of appropriate choices of our axes, we can just scale this gradient to whatever we need it to be. I'm just drawing this being pretty much equal to one right now, just for, well, that's how these, yeah, that's how these figures are conventionally drawn with this c just equal to one. So these two lines which I've drawn, are all of the points on which ds squared is equal to zero. So these are all of the points in Minkowski space which have zero space-time separation from this origin point here. So this is now 
already some wildly non-trivial structure. Essentially, all of the points on these two lines have no distance from this origin point here. And now we need to just get our heads around the fact that obviously we're drawing this picture. There is what we would previously think of as being distance between, say, this point and this point. But we have to realise that that's a Euclidean distance that I'm kind of wanting to assign to this kind of interval which I'm representing here. The, the actual Minkowskian distance between these two points is zero because they lie on this special line. We just need to remove our Euclidean kind of preconceived notions about the distances which we are used to working with when we draw a picture like this. We have to always remember this is a Minkowski picture. Lines that are, or these two lines which I've defined here, all have zero distance from this point here. So these lines are incredibly special. They represent something called the light cone. It's known as the light cone. And we're going to see, once we start talking about this C in terms of the speed of light, we're going to see it's essentially the world line that light follows through Minkowski space. Light travels along these lines of the light cone, and it kind of essentially represents the maximum possible speed at which you can travel through Minkowski space. Because if this straight line now represents a world line, the kind of the gradient of that world line represents the speed at which you're traveling through Minkowski space. And if your speed, say, exceeds this line, you're, say, traveling on a world line that looks something like that, your gradient is going to be greater than the gradient of this line. You're then going to be traveling faster than the speed of light. So that was just a quick brief comment. We're not talking about speeds yet, but I just wanted to make you aware that's what kind of the placing of these lines means, or rather what these lines kind of physically represent. But mathematically at least, they simply represent all of the points in Minkowski space which have zero distance from the origin. Okay, so these zero distance from the origin points are now going to kind of separate Minkowski space into three distinct regions. These, or the points that lie on these two lines, have zero space-time separation from the origin. Let's consider the points which have now a positive or negative separation from the origin and see what they represent. 